piece that you just heard, all of the sounds except the piano and drums were produced by the synthesizer. The melodies, counter melodies, and bass lines were improvised one part at a time and recorded on a multi track tape recorder. I'm Don Muro, and I'm going to talk about improvising with synthesizers. In terms of melody, harmony, and rhythm, improvising on synthesizer is no different from improvising on any other instrument. But in terms of the production, modification, and control of sound, the synthesizer offers the performer an extremely wide range of unique capabilities. The synthesis has the potential to improvise with pitch, timbre, envelope, volume, and location. Before we go any further, let's make sure that we understand how these properties of sound relate to musical instruments. For our purposes, the pitch of an instrument will refer to its frequency range. In other words, how high and how low it can play. Timbre will refer to the identifying tone quality of an instrument that distinguishes it from another instrument. The envelope of a sound will refer to the qualities of articulation. By that I mean how long it takes for a sound to start, how long the sound lasts, and how long it takes the sound to stop. For example, the short envelope of a snare drum is quite different from the long, slowly fading envelope of a cymbal. Volume will refer to the loudness of an instrument, and location will refer to the place from which sound emanates. On acoustical instruments, sound emanates from the instrument itself. On electronic instruments, sound emanates from speakers. In this lecture, I will demonstrate how each of these properties of sound can be an important element in synthesizer improvisation. Almost all of the examples will be taken from the music you heard at the beginning of this recording. The piece is called Here It Comes, and is from my album called Anthology. Let's begin with pitch. I will discuss two aspects of pitch, frequency range and pitch control. I said earlier that frequency range means how high or how low an instrument can play. The synthesizer is capable of playing so high that it becomes inaudible, or so low that we can't tell what pitches are being played. The first example I'm going to play is from the lead synthesizer line, and although the pitches are not extremely high, they're the highest ones in this piece. I use the same synthesizer to produce the bass sound. Here's an example of how low the bass line goes. That's pretty low, but I take it down much lower in another part of the piece. In fact, the pitch gets so low that you won't be able to tell what note it ends on. You'll just hear some very slow oscillations or clicks. That gives you an idea of the synthesizer frequency range in this piece. The other aspect of pitch that I mentioned earlier is called pitch control. The first type of pitch control that I want to demonstrate is called portamento. Portamento is a smooth sliding effect from one note to the next. In this first example, the synthesizer note seems to slide up from nowhere. I produce this effect by hitting the lowest note on the keyboard before I recorded the solo. I then turned the portamento switch on with my left hand and played the first note of the solo with my right hand. As soon as the portamento reached the note I played, I turned the portamento off and continued playing the solo. Here's the effect. That was a very obvious use of portamento. It's not quite as obvious in this next example. I use the same technique as before. I hit a low note before playing the phrase, turn the portamento on so that the first note of the phrase would slide up seemingly from nowhere, and then turn the portamento off immediately after I hit the first note. Here's the example. Listen closely to the first note.
Both of the examples I've just played would have a different feel if I didn't add portamento. I now want to demonstrate another type of pitch control, which is called pitch bending. Pitch bending is a technique used most often by guitarists who push the string across the fretboard to raise or bend the original pitch, like this. The synthesizer can bend pitches up or down over a range of a semitone or several octaves. On the left-hand side of almost every synthesizer keyboard is a pitch bend wheel or slider. Turning the wheel in one direction raises the pitch. Turning it in the opposite direction will lower the pitch. Here's an obvious example of a pitch bend. This is from the synthesizer solo near the end of Here It Comes. I simply held two notes down on the keyboard and turned the pitch bend wheel with my left hand so that the pitches of the notes would rise. Here's the effect. Here's an example of a pitch bend in the opposite direction. This is from the bass synthesizer solo. Both examples use obvious pitch bends to give a phrase a sharp, directional movement. In this next example, the pitch bending is not quite as extreme. On the last note of this phrase, I turn the wheel very slightly to give the musical line a kind of falling quality. So far, none of the examples of pitch bending have been to another specific pitch. They've all been either obvious or subtle bends up or down. But it's also possible to bend to a note in a scale. The use of vibrato in this example leads us into the next type of pitch control, which is called frequency modulation. Frequency modulation basically means that a frequency or a note is going to be changed or modulated. One of the most basic examples of frequency modulation is vibrato. For example, when a guitarist plays a note and rocks his finger back and forth on the string, causing the pitch to go sharp and flat, he's actually changing or modulating the pitch of that note. Here's a guitar note with no vibrato. Here's the same note with vibrato added. Vibrato can be added to notes played on the synthesizer simply by turning a dial or by raising a slider. Listen to how I added vibrato to the sustain notes in this phrase. Here's an example of using vibrato to help accent a note. First, let's listen to a phrase without vibrato. Here's the same phrase with vibrato added. Listen to how the vibrato shapes the line. Adding vibrato to certain notes gives the phrase more of a direction and makes the line more interesting. I'm now going to play another example of frequency modulation. This effect was produced in two steps. First, I added so much vibrato to a note that the sound turned into a buzz. Then I gradually lowered the pitch of that note until it became a series of clicks. Now remember, this is still frequency modulation, but it's going to sound very different from the vibrato effect you just heard. As you can hear, there are quite a few variables to work with. I now want to talk about the use of another property of sound. Let's talk about timbre. Earlier, I said that timbre is the tone color of a sound, usually described by words such as bright or dark. Actually, timbre is a pretty complex subject, and to explain it scientifically is beyond the scope of this lecture. 
I simply want you to be able to recognize some obvious differences in timbres that I used in this piece. The first timbre I used can be described as a very bright, reedy sound. The next interesting timbre to be heard is on the bass synthesizer sound. This sound is much more percussive and much darker sounding. The next variation in timbre can be heard on the melody synthesizer sound. This sound is a combination of a piccolo and a clarinet. A different timbre can be heard on this next example, which I call the trumpet track. Not because it's supposed to sound like trumpets, but because of where the line falls in the arrangement. In other words, if I were going to arrange this piece for a stage band, I'd give this part to the trumpets. This next example of timbre sounds something like a percussive combination of a bassoon and an oboe. In this next example, you can hear the timbre change. The melodic line begins with a dark sound, but as the line goes higher, the timbre gets brighter. I now want you to listen to the first 30 seconds of the piece, this time concentrating on the different timbres that can be heard at the same time. Using these different timbres on various parts makes the piece much more interesting and gives it a richer, more orchestral texture. All of the examples of different timbres that I've just demonstrated are in this example. I'd like to show you one more example of an interesting timbre. This timbral effect was produced by using a device on the synthesizer called a sample and hold. To explain how the sample and hold works is also beyond the scope of this lecture, but I can demonstrate what it did to the timbre of a sound. In the last four bars of Here It Comes, I used the sample and hold to produce what are called random timbres. This means that I didn't choose what timbres to use. The sample and hold did. Listen closely to the continuously changing timbres of this sound. It's quite an interesting color. I purposely saved this effect for the last four bars of the piece to make the ending more interesting. I'm now going to play those four bars again, this time adding all of the instruments. See if you can hear the effect. The 
That should give you an idea of what can be done with timbre in synthesizer improvisation. Let's talk about the next property of sound. I mentioned earlier that envelope means the shape of the sound, how it starts, how long it lasts, and how it ends. Some instruments, such as the piano or drum, can't vary their envelope to a great extent. On a synthesizer, it's possible to vary the envelope from continuous sound to a sound so short that it sounds like a click instead of a note. Here's an example of a sound envelope that lasts continuously for almost 30 seconds. This is the longest envelope in the piece. Here's an example of the shortest sound envelope in the piece. Using different envelopes on different musical lines in a piece is another important way of producing a rich orchestral texture. The two remaining properties of sound can both be used to produce the effect of sonic direction or movement. The property of volume or loudness can be used for accenting a note or line and also for creating the illusion of sound moving towards or away from the listener. Listen to this excerpt I played earlier to demonstrate a pitch bend. The pitch bend produces a rising effect. I'm now going to enhance this rising effect by lowering the volume of the synthesizer as the pitch goes up. This will now produce the effect of the sound going up and moving away from you. Here's another example of the same technique. This is the end of the bass synthesizer sound you heard earlier. I'm going to lower the volume as the pitch goes down. You should now hear the effect of the sound going down and away from you. You can hear how volume can be used to produce an effect of movement towards or away from a listener. The property of location can also produce some interesting spatial effects. If you're hearing this lecture in stereo, I'm sure you notice that some sounds come from the right speaker, some sounds come from the left speaker, and some sounds come from the spot in the center of the two speakers. This spreading out of the sound produces an effect of spaciousness. For example, I'm going to play the synthesizer melody lines near the end of the piece. The same sounds are going to come out of both speakers. I'm going to play that example again, but this time I'm going to put two lines in the right speaker, and the other two lines in the left speaker. Listen to the difference this change in location makes. This use of location is far more interesting than the first example. The melodic lines seem to complement each other not only musically but spatially. Another interesting location effect which is used in this piece is called panning. Panning is simply an audible change in the location of a sound. First, listen to the sound that I recorded. I'm going to play that sound again, but this time I'm going to start the sound in the left speaker and move it or pan it to the right speaker. You can hear how these changes in location give the music a more dynamic and visual aspect. I'm now going to play the completed version of Here It Comes, and I'd like you to sit back and hear the examples in their original context. I hope that by now you have a better idea of how the synthesizer works with the properties of sound. 
by stretching these properties of sound in unusual ways, the synthesizer becomes a highly creative instrument for improvisation. <laughs> 